Welcome everyone to the second of this year's Burlington House Lunchtime Scientist Talks. My name is Joe and I work at the Linnaean Society, which aims to inform, involve and inspire people about nature and its significance through our special collections that we have in our building, our programmes that run throughout the year and as well as our scientific publications. Yes, hello. Hi, my name is Lucinda, and I work at the Royal Astronomical Society, which encourages the study of astronomy, solar system science, geophysics, and other closely related branches of science. Yeah, it's really exciting for the Royal Astronomical Society and the Linnaean Society to be working together in this way. Uh, and the reason why we're doing that, uh, one of the reasons is that we both live in Burlington House, which is this great big building in the center of London, uh, alongside some other cultural organizations such as the Royal Academy of Arts, the Geological Society, the Society of Antiquaries and the Royal Society of Chemistry. We've co-produced this series for young people um, who have maybe a, a small interest or a big interest in astrobiology and want to learn more about this exciting field and the people who have careers within it. Here, this webinar is taking place on Zoom and it is also streaming onto YouTube if you're watching this live, you can type questions or comments in the Q&A boxes and our speaker will try to answer them at the end. Um, our speaker today is Professor Lewis Dartnell. Lewis is a research, a research scientist, presenter and author based in London with a keen interest in the field of astrobiology and the search for microbial life on Mars. Lewis is a professor in science communication at the University of Westminster and has published four popular science books with his latest origins, How the Earth Made Us, being the Sunday Times top history book of 2019. His talk is titled Life in the Solar System. Thank you for joining us, Lewis. Welcome, uh, we are grateful thank to you. having you and it's all on to you now. Thank you ever so much. Uh, and thank you all to, to the audience for, for coming along. Uh, my name's Lewis, as you just heard. And what I thought might be uh, most useful for the students watching before I start talking about um, the details of how we search for life on other planets is just to give you a little bit of an insight into my background and how I got into the career in astrobiology and into searching for life on other planets. Um, just by talking a little bit about my um, education background, my, my school roots are here. And actually, I grew up in Kenya, in Nairobi, and I went to a prep school. Nairobi called uh, the Banda, which is uh, Swahili for mud hut. So I went to the mud hut school in Nairobi, uh, at prep school, and then studied um, up through GCSE and then A-level, the three sciences and mathematics to then specialised at university in a degree in biological sciences. So I'm a biologist by background. And all of the stuff that I'm about to tell you about in astrobiology and search for life on other planets to do with the astronomy and the physics and the geology are things that I've picked up and learnt along the way since graduating as a biologist. Like I think many scientists today are now very broad and spread beyond just one discipline to become what's known as interdisciplinary. And astrobiology in particular is very, very interdisciplinary. It mixes biology with physics and chemistry and uh, geology. And the way that I was actually able to get into astrobiology as a research field uh, was at University College London in a, in a new department they'd set up when I joined called Complex, where I was able to do a uh, PhD combining biology with other aspects, other sciences. And I was given an incredible opportunity to pretty much write my own PhD proposal. I got to choose whatever it is I wanted to research into as long as it was biology overlapping with something else. And I said, thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to look into the possibility of biology beyond the earth. I want to get involved in some astrobiology. And so the title of my thesis when you finish a PhD and write up three years of your life in what is effectively a hardback book. You have written in gold lettering 
down the spine of this hardback book of your thesis when it's published. Uh, there's your name, there's the year, and quite often there's the title of what you've been researching. And the title of my, of my thesis was The Cosmic Ionizing uh, Radiation Environment of Mars, which is quite a mouthful. And if I ever meet anyone new at a party and they ask me what my science is all about, what do I research into, and I tell them that, well, quite often I get left by myself in the kitchen of the party for the rest of the night. So I've, I've learned uh, through the hard way, if you like, to describe the science that I do within astrobiology as looking into the Martian death rays. Now, these Martian death rays aren't being wielded by tripods if the Martians come to invade the Earth. The Martian death rays are what would be killing off any native Martian life. If simple bacterial life did ever get started on Mars and is there on the, the surface today, it's basically unprotected. It's naked to some very nasty radiation from outer space called the cosmic rays. Stuff that we're protected on against here on the surface of the Earth by a lovely thick atmosphere above our heads and by the Earth's magnetic field. Mars doesn't have uh, either of those kinds of protection. So this radiation from outer space bombards down onto the surface of Mars as potentially very dangerous and very problematic for any bacteria that might be there. So a lot of what I do is uh, writing computer simulations of what that radiation hitting the Martian surface is like, as you can see on the left hand of the picture here, but also going to some of the most extreme environments on Earth, Mars-like environments on our own planet, to understand how life survives there, and in particular what their radiation resistance is like. How long could they survive on Mars? Uh, so the picture I've got on the screen here is of uh, the dry valleys in Antarctica, where some of my samples have come from. Uh, but I've also been on field work in the Atacama Desert, um, in South America and Chile, which is one of the oldest and driest deserts anywhere on the Earth. So my research, at least, is a combination of computer work, simulations, doing experiments in the lab, but also getting to travel around the world during normal times when there isn't a global pandemic and going to some of the most incredible environments on our planets, uh, on our planet, as well as going to conferences and meeting people at uh, meetings around the world to talk about what we've discovered. Uh, some of this work of mine has been picked up quite nicely by the press, by the media, uh, by, by journalists and, uh, and newspapers. Uh, clearly my favorite piece of, of press coverage on my research was in the Sun newspaper, as you can see here, where they're talking about Martians hiding on the red planet, about how deep stuff would have to be to have been protected from these cosmic rays. But we're not talking about green bug-eyed monsters. Uh, like in the picture here, we're talking about hardy, single-celled life, life like bacteria on Earth. And on the other half of what I do in my career, alongside the research, I also take a lot of time um, writing as a, as a freelance journalist, as a science writer, uh, writing for newspapers and magazines and websites, um, but also writing books. Uh, my first book, Life in the Universe, is an introduction to the science of astrobiology that you can see here. So if you want to ask any questions at the end of my talk, not just about the science and research that I do, but about different jobs or different careers in science, perhaps science jobs that don't involve wearing a lab coat uh, or working as a, as a research scientist, but perhaps being a journalist or working in the media, then we can talk about that as well. You can ask questions about whatever it is you like. But in terms of where we are now in this new science of astrobiology, of this search for life beyond the earth, I was trying to understand the origins of life on our own planet, how it evolves and changes over billions of years, and perhaps most importantly, how life might be distributed beyond the earth. Is the earth unique? in being a biological planet? Or perhaps are there thousands, millions, billions of Earth-like or moons that have life on the surface? And these are the kind of deep questions that astrobiology is, is trying to answer and trying to, to solve. 
And we've been making huge advances in recent years in three main areas that have been giving astrobiologists like myself a huge amount of, of confidence and optimism that we could be right on the brink of finding these first examples of life beyond our planet, finding alien life. And these three main areas of, of ongoing research are in extremophiles, some of the hardiest forms of life on Earth, as well as how we've been exploring our own solar system with robots and probes. And you may have seen the news that a couple of months ago, NASA landed its uh, most recent, its latest next generation Mars rover. But we've also been making huge advances in discovering other solar systems, the so-called extrasolar planets, and understanding what some of those planets are like, whether they could have life on the surface as well. And what I wanted to focus on in this particular talk is talk a little bit about the extremophiles, but then move uh, relatively quickly into talking about possibility of life in our solar system. Where are the planets and moons we think are most likely to have life on their surface? Now, looking at these extremophiles, these hardiest forms of life on planet Earth, these are like survival superheroes. We, we are finding incredibly resilient forms of life in the most inhospitable, the most hostile environments anywhere on the Earth. And one example of an extremophile that I want to tell you about lives in this environment on Earth. This is in Yellowstone Park in North America. It's a very volcanically active region of the Earth. And you can imagine we are sat in a helicopter peering out the window, looking down at the ground in Yellowstone Park, which is a very volcanically active region of the Earth. We find lakes of water, like you can see in this photograph, that have been heated underneath by all that volcanic activity. So these lakes of water in Yellowstone Park are very, very hot. They're bubbling and steaming and boiling hot but also they're very acidic with all of those volcanic gases bubbling up through them. And just for scale, running alongside this volcanically heated lake, you can see in the picture here, is a path with some people walking along it. Now, if you were to be unlucky enough to slip off that path and splash into this lake in Yellowstone Park, you, you would die, you would die exceedingly quickly and in agonizing pain as you were boiled to death in a great big steaming vat of volcanic lake water. And actually if they didn't fish your corpse out of this lake quickly enough, the skin and the flesh and the muscles would be dissolved off your bones. It is that hot and that acidic. This is not the kind of environment you would ever want to find yourself in. But the colours of this lake, the greens and the yellows and the oranges and the reds, those are the colours of life. They're the colours of thermophiles or heat-loving organisms and acidophiles, acid-loving organisms. Bugs, single-celled bacteria and, and archaea, which have called this hellhole of a place their home, and they thrive under those incredibly inhospitable conditions that would kill you or I very, very quickly. And we find extremophiles not just in very hot or very acidic environments, but also very cold environments, very alkaline environments, very salty environments, very high radiation environments. And so one of the important things about studying these extremophiles is they teach us about the survival limits of life in general. What kind of environments can support biology as we know it? What sort of environments should we be searching for beyond the earth to have the best possible chance of finding some life that could, have, could sub be surviving there? And so if you uh, take all the extremophiles together and plot 
the different ranges of conditions they can survive under. Um, on a three-dimensional graph, like, like I'm showing you here, you can plot the range of conditions they survive on the pH scale, from very acidic to very alkaline conditions, or on a temperature scale, from freezing cold to boiling hot, or salinity, from pure distilled water up to saturated salt solutions on the uh, upright axis of this graph. And you plot the range of conditions that known extreme files, life we've discovered on Earth, can tolerate. And you build up this green boot-shaped cloud. This is the survival envelope of all life on Earth. At any point inside that green shape in this cloud, there is a cell, a life form that we've already discovered that can tolerate that particular combination of hostile, nasty conditions. And the really exciting thing for astrobiology and the possibility of finding life beyond the Earth is that this survival envelope of terrestrial life overlaps with the conditions in extraterrestrial places. We found life on Earth that could survive the environment we think existed or still exists today on places like Mars or Europa, one of the icy moons of Jupiter, or perhaps high up in the cloud decks of Venus, where it's still very hot and very acidic. There are bugs we're familiar with here on Earth that could survive in these alien environments. It really isn't all that crazy at all to be talking about extraterrestrial life because of what these extremophiles on Earth have been telling us and teaching us. So I want you to bear that in mind, what we've been talking about so far, about these incredible range of conditions that life on Earth can tolerate and survive. And now come on on tour with me through our solar system. We're going to follow in the footsteps or follow in the wheel ruts of the robots and probes and rovers that we've launched to the other planets and moons in our solar system to see which of these worlds we think offer the best possible hope and opportunity for finding life uh, on them. And we'll start in this spot. This is a desert environment. You, you can see the dry, dusty soil on the ground that's been blown into these rip little ripples and sand dunes by the wind. You can see some high altitude clouds in the top of the sky here. But this is no place on Earth. This is the surface of Mars. And Mars, our next door neighbor planet, is a very, very interesting place indeed. In many respects, Mars is the most Earth-like place we know about. We know for a fact that billions of years ago, when life was first getting started here on Earth, that Mars was itself a much uh, more Earth-like, much more hospitable, much warmer and wetter place. We know that it had seas and lakes and rivers of liquid water gushing across its face. It would have had a much thicker atmosphere to shield and blanket and protect the planet. And it would have had organic molecules, the building blocks of all life as we know it on Earth, would have been raining down onto the surface of Mars aboard meteorites and comets in just the same way they would have been delivered to the early Earth and possibly helped give us a leg up, possibly helped life on Earth get started. So in terms of planetary habitability, in terms of providing the right sort of environment, at least in its past, Mars seems to tick all of the right boxes. There's no reason to suppose that life didn't get started there when we were getting started here on our primordial Earth. And so as, as scientists, as explorers, we would dearly like to go to Mars and have a good look around, see if we can find signs of ancient Martian life, possibly fossilized and, and long since dead today, maybe still alive underground, even still today. And one of the missions that I've been involved in um, is this rover mission that you can see here, which is the European 
space agency rover, uh, the ExoMars rover, which has now been dubbed the Rosalind Franklin rover. And because we've designed this rover, which will be launching next year to explore Mars and look for signs of life, we've given it a whole bunch of kit that you, you might have anticipated, you might expect. We've given our Mars rover six wheels, which is even better than four wheel drive for not getting stuck in the dust when you're millions of miles from the nearest um, pickup truck or, or a van. It's got solar panels on its back to recharge its battery and to power the rover. It's got cameras, robotic eyes, high up on the top of a thin stalk-like neck. And perhaps most exciting for this particular mission, ExoMars has got a drill. You can see that the box on the front of this artist's impression is a box with a drill inside it that is two meters long. Up until this point, all you've been able to do for Mars is scoop around a little bit in the surface dust with a robotic arm um, or drill a little bit into the surface of rocks with a little drill at the length of your little finger. But with ExoMars, we're going to be able to get two meters underground. We're going to grab handfuls of that Martian dirt and bring that soil back up to the surface from where it's been protected underground from things like the cosmic radiation that I study, and therefore hopefully, hopefully has been able to preserve signs of ancient Martian life, so-called biosignatures, or signs of complex organic chemistry, the sort of molecular fingerprints of ancient life. So the ExoMars mission is a very, very exciting mission to have worked on. We're launching it next year, as I mentioned. And if we look, Beyond Mars, if we look beyond our next door neighbor in the solar system and travel further out to Jupiter, um, which is the largest planet in our solar system, it's, a, it's an enormous gas giant world. Pluto is the, the big daddy of our solar system and it's effectively nothing more than atmosphere, big ball of gas. Jupiter doesn't really have a surface to speak of that, that we would we would understand in that sense. It certainly doesn't have rivers and oceans of liquid water that we're, we could see life getting started in. So in terms of astrobiology and the possibility of life beyond the Earth, when we talk about Jupiter, it's not really the planet itself that we care about. It is the system of moons orbiting Jupiter, the Galilean satellites. And if you look in the picture here, we have Jupiter right in the middle with this entire system of moons orbiting it, with Io being the innermost Galilean large satellite, and then Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And just by looking at the faces of these moons, I've shown you pictures on the bottom here that were taken by a probe called Galileo that went out to explore the Jovian system, you'll notice something really weird, really curious about these large Jovian moons. The innermost moon, Io, is this bright, angry, orangey, yellow color. That's the color of volcanic sulfur. Io is an incredibly volcanically active moon. It's, it's a tortured little world that is constantly vomiting itself inside out in this never-ending cycle of hot, intense volcanism. You do not want to go anywhere near Io for your holidays in outer space. And if we look to the opposite end, to Callisto, which is the outermost Galilean satellite, we see that the face of Callisto is still pockmarked and scarred with all of these impact craters left over from the very earliest era of our solar system, the late heavy bombardment when all of the rubble left over from the building planets was still flying around throughout a space and slamming down the surface of the earth and onto the surface of the moon and also onto the surface of Callisto. And in all of that time, since the entire history of the solar system, billions and billions of years, 
Callisto has never changed its face. It's a cold, dead world contrasting against the hot, violent world of Io. And in between the two, we find Europa. And we think that Europa is a lovely, warm, wet world. The beneath its face, beneath a shell of hard, frozen water ice, there lays a deep, dark, alien ocean. We think that Europa has more liquid water inside it than all of the seas and lakes and rivers and oceans of the whole of the earth put together. That it is Europa that is the water world of our solar system and not the earth. And so again, as explorers, we would dearly like to get out to Europa with some kind of dedicated landing mission to try to touch down on the outer surface of this sort of eggshell of frozen ice and then drill or maybe melt away straight down through kilometers and kilometers of that hard ice to get into that deep dark ocean, explore it with some kind of robotic submarine, maybe try to find places like hydrothermal vents or black smokers on the European seafloor, which on earth support little bubbles, little oases of life. And potentially we could find life in Europa's dark ocean as well. This is one of the most exciting places in the solar system, the possibility of having life that is alive even today, whereas life on Mars may have long since fallen extinct as the planet became cold and very, very dry. And if we move out beyond Jupiter to Saturn, to the magnificent ringed planet in our solar system, again, it's not the gas giant planet itself that we care about. It's one of the moons orbiting Saturn. It's Titan. Now, Titan is a real giant of a moon. It is a moon that is even larger than the planet Mercury. And it is the only moon in the solar system to have one of these to talk about, to, to have an atmosphere. This is the blue skies of the moon Titan seen in this photograph here. But the problem with Titan is the entire world is enveloped, it's completely enshrouded in this really thick, orange, hazy smog layer. It stops us and our telescopes being able to peer down onto the surface of Titan to see what it was like. And our first glimpse that we ever got of what the Titanic landscape looks like is when we went there, we sent out a robotic probe called Huygens. And again, this is what was a European Space Agency mission, although we, we hitched a lift with uh, NASA and the Cassini probe to take us out to Saturn. But it was a European probe that parachuted gently down through this cloud layer of Titan and sent us back the very first images we'd ever seen of what the Titanic landscape looks like. And we were astonished. This picture we see on the left here is this Huygens probe dangling beneath its parachute, being buffeted from side to side by the ti Titanic winds, looking straight down in this radar image of the landscape of Titan. And it looks uncannily familiar. This looks very familiar, very similar to what you might expect in, on Earth, in the English countryside. The pale region at the top of the picture are the hills and the mountains, the highlands of Titan, whereas the dark region at the bottom is very, very smooth and very, very flat. This is the bed of a dried up lake. And unmistakably, snaking their way down from the hills to that dried up lake bed is a network of river valleys. And since that image was taken, we have since seen um, lakes full of fluid, huge sea-like lakes um, towards the pole of Titan. Titan is, is sodden and wet. The problem with Titan is that it is so cold that this isn't liquid water 
that's forming cloud and falling as rain and flowing down these rivers and filling up these seas and lakes on Titan. This is liquid methane and ethane. And so although Titan has a huge lot of very active and dynamic processes, it's very Earth-like in a lot of important respects. It has a form of a hydrological cycle. It has a lot of complex organic chemistry going on. It's all in liquid ethane and methane, however. And we don't know enough yet about what sort of chemistry can get going on dissolved in liquid methane. Is it sensible to be talking about methane-based life on Titan compared to water-based life here on Earth? So although Titan's very exciting, there's still a big question mark hangs over it about whether it could be habitable in any sense we understand. Um, and certainly molecules like DNA that are crucial for life on Earth would simply not work on Titan with its liquid methane as a solvent. Now, I wanted to move um, in the sort of third chapter of this book and just mention very briefly the planets we're now discovering beyond our own solar system. And in the last 20 years or so, we've now discovered well over 4,000 new worlds orbiting other suns in our galaxy, planets orbiting other stars in the night sky, which are called extrasolar planets or exoplanets. And this is where we are uh, in our home galaxy in the Milky Way. Um, you can see where I've uh, shown that arrow. That's where the solar system is, the Earth is, just on the inside edge of one of these spiral arms of, of the glorious whirlpool galaxy that we live in. And over time, we've been finding uh, more and more planets, more and more solar systems around these other stars in our galaxy. These are just a few of the alien solar systems that we found first up. As shown on this diagram, I've lined up their stars, the suns along the left-hand side and compared against our own solar system running along the bottom. So you have Mercury and then Venus, then Earth in our solar system along the bottom. And the first thing you might notice about many of these earliest exoplanets we discovered is that on the whole, they are really big planets, many times more massive than Jupiter, which is itself over 300 times more massive than the Earth. And many of these earliest planets we found orbit very, very closely to their star. They are scorchingly, searingly hot places. They're known as hot Jupiter planets, and they don't offer any chance of life, as we understand it. But over time, and it makes sense that the, that the first planets we discovered were the easy planets to find, the big ones, the massive ones orbiting closely to their star. And over time, our hunt for extrasolar planets has found smaller and smaller worlds orbiting further and further from their star. And we think that we are right on the brink and in the coming years of being able to find a very special kind of planet indeed, a twin of our home world, a very Earth-like planet, a planet that has an orbit of almost exactly one year around a sun-like star. I.e. it's the same distance from the heat of its campfire as we are from ours. It's not too close and hot, it's not too far away and cold, but it's just right, just the right climate on its surface for liquid water, for seas and rivers and oceans, and therefore the best possible chance for life to get started on. So perhaps if I come back and I'm invited by the RAS and the Linnaean societies again in another 10 years or so to do another talk about astrobiology, I might be able to tell you about the first Earth-like planets we've discovered. And with subsequent missions, subsequent space telescopes, we are, we'll be able to discover that those Earth-like planets are not just there, not just detection of them, but characterization of these planets. We'll find out what these worlds are like. And in particular, we want to be able to read the chemistry of their atmosphere, see what their air is made out of using spectroscopy, see if we can see the telltale fingerprint of oxygen gas, perhaps mixed with methane, 
because the only way that we would know how to explain an atmosphere like that is because life has pumped out those gases just the way it has on the earth. We'd look for a biosignature present on an entire world. And so maybe in 10 years time, maybe 15, 20 years, you'll be able to go out and point to a particular star in the night sky and say, there is a star that we know for a fact has an Earth-like planet orbiting it, and there's oxygen in its air. There is life on that world. There, that planet is where our neighbors are living. There is alien life on that planet. But as an astrobiologist, I'd be very excited about finding life on an extrasolar planet. I'd be probably even more excited if our robotic exploration and then hopefully human exploration of our own solar system might find traces of life perhaps on Mars or Europa or Titan, places in our own solar system, places we can bring samples back to the Earth to study in our laboratories and get to see how that life works. Imagine a biology class. We can look down a microscope at an alien microorganism. You can test whether it uses DNA or something else. Maybe it uses something other than proteins to run the machinery inside its cell. And so peer onto the bonnet of this alien life and see what makes it tick. See if it's truly alien and uses chemistry in a different way to survive. And so that for me is the real promise and the real excitement of astrobiology. The feeling that we are right on the brink of some truly profound discoveries that would change the way we think about our place in the cosmos um, and whether there could be life out there. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about uh, for just 30, 40 minutes or so. Is it's a very broad overview of how we are searching our solar system for signs of life and what the extremophiles teach us. We've got some time for questions now. Um, and if any of this has been of interest to you, you can uh, pick up a copy of one of my books, Life in the Universe, or anything else, uh, any of the other books that I've written. But we have uh, plenty of time now for any questions if any of you have written them in to the chat box, I, I guess uh, Joe will be able to read them out for us. <laughs> so we we have asked. plenty of questions for Excellent. you, Professor. Um, and fantastic talk. Uh, what a great journey that you took us on through, you know, what is astrobiology now? What are we looking at now? And that's just as a, as a, as a teacher who um, teaches GCSE astronomy myself, um, having to do these weekly courses, I'm constantly having to update my presentations because there's it's a very so fast moving field isn't it so much science coming out and so much new information i was just talking to them about the milky way yesterday so um and already you know we, we we're learning so much from gaia's third you know data yeah. <laughs> really. so um yeah had to update that so it's fantastic and um i have to say i was really impressed by that image of exomars that you used it looked like was is that actually the vehicle as is, or was that a kind of a souped up version of X? Yeah, so actually I, I, I should have updated the picture. This is an artist's impression and they've, they've made it look a, a bit cooler. It looks a little bit more like, uh, <laughs> was it um, in short circuit, Johnny Five Alive? It is um, very cool. I was like, that's- I, I think it, it makes it look quite a little bit like Wally, I think as well. <laughs> um, but we, I mean, you're right, I should have updated this. We, we, there are photographs of what the, the Mars rover now looks like because Mars has now been constructed. This is like yeah, a slide. I Admittedly, I really like that that image of XMR. <laughs> it looks <laughs> it's uh, it's very enticing. It looks really cool. Um, and we have a question about your work with um, ExoMars. So um, when we have a um, someone who was with us last week, Jade, she asked some really great questions, and she's lined up um, several really good ones for you as well. But I'm going to start with her question about uh, what was your role with the ExoMars team. Um, so mm, so the UK's involvement uh, in the European Space Agency. Um, a lot of that goes, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of that goes through the UK Space Agency, UK SA. Um, you, you can look that up on Google and have a read what, what sort of work the UK Space Agency does. And they have funded me in the past uh, for a fellowship for doing astrobiology research. I, I've been funded by the Space Agency to look into the possibility of life on Mars. And that work was tied directly to ExoMars and the suite of instruments that it has on board. And in particular, a very, very neat bit of kit called a Raman spectrometer, which I immediately have to point out to people has got nothing to do with noodles. Raman spectroscopy is a way of using a laser to shine at your sample 
and then look at the light that comes bounced, comes uh, comes back at you, and, and do spectroscopy on it, and look for the telltale fingerprints of not just minerals and the geology of what you're looking at, but Raman spectroscopy is also really good at telling you about uh, organic molecules that might be what you're looking at. Looking at it's kind of a two for one instrument. So Raman spectroscopy is ideally suited for the ExoMars rover, and it uh, will be flying next year, as I'm saying. So I was involved in in that research funded by our own space agency. You know, everyone hears a lot about NASA, um, but we have our own space agency in the UK as well. There's a, a, a quite a, a lot of questions. Uh, some of them are about careers and the other ones are more about science. I'm gonna throw some sciencey ones at you first yep. um, and then we'll talk about careers definitely later. Um, I've got a couple of questions from Ernie. And it's around our current classification system of organisms here on Earth and whether it needs to be expanded in any way to talk about extraterrestrial life. Um, did you want to talk to that at all? Yes, yeah, so um, all life we found anywhere on Earth, all of the extremophiles, all these incredibly hostile environments, any life we find in there turns out to be part of the same tree of life but they all fall onto the same phylogenetic tree. And so that tells us that all life on Earth that we find today all descends from the same origin, the same root of life, the same progenitor cell. Um, and if we go and find life on Mars, one of the things we're going to be very, very interested in doing, will be you know, top of our to-do list, we'll be trying to work out, if is this life we found on Mars, or maybe Europa, is this... Um, genuinely alien? Is this life from a very different origin of life? Is that life that is indigenous to Mars? Or perhaps is it life that might have started on Earth and been transferred to Mars? Perhaps during this late heavy bombardment um, when the inner planets were effectively sneezing in each other's faces the whole time, transferring rocks, potentially transferring life between the inner planets. So if you find life on Mars, we're going to want to try and work out, is that life on Mars um, different from us? Or is it perhaps suspiciously similar? Is it, is it indistinguishable from life on Earth, terrestrial life? And therefore, actually, it falls on the same tree of life as, as you and I do and all, all other life on Earth. Um, or is it from a separate origin? And that's going to be one of the key questions we're going to try to, to tease apart once we have found cells, if we find them on Mars. Uh, I guess a, a similar but opposite question is looking at the history of life on Earth uh, and events that biologists know about. Hmm. Um, there's an example here about uh, the eukaryotic merger, um, which for anyone that doesn't know, it's uh, way back when, uh, right at the, at the beginning of things uh, emerging on Earth, and whether that could occur somewhere else in the universe and the probability of that to actually be looking for the same events happening elsewhere. Yeah, it gets quite hard to talk about the probability of things happening because at the moment we have only one example of life on Earth. Our, our entire data set is, is one. Um, so it's hard to try and deduce from that what is the probability of life getting started? What is the probability that prokaryotic life, bacterial-like life, develops into a eukaryotic cell? It happened on Earth, but it's hard to deduce how likely that was. Um, because, of course, if life on Earth hadn't got started, we wouldn't be here to look around ourselves and ask these questions about how life got started. So there's a huge selective bias um, when trying to talk about life on our own planet that we are part of. And so I think that's one of the most important outcomes if we do find life on Mars and if we can demonstrate that it is from an, an independent genesis of life, that Martian life is a separate origin from Earth life. Because then we're in the situation, we've got two side-by-side -side neighboring planets that have both independently developed life of their own. And that starts telling us that actually the probability of life emerging is, is quite a good chance. It's quite a high probability. And therefore, finding life on Mars tells us that finding life on all these other planets across the galaxy could be pretty high as well. So there's a lot riding on finding life in our, in our solar system and then getting some kind of handle on those probabilities, which we can't even guess at at the moment. 
you know, it's really interesting to be thinking about, oh, we're, go- we're going to find it. And then what's actually the next step after that? Mm. Planning for that eventuality already. Uh, I'll pass over to Lucinda for some questions. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so some of the things that you've been sharing with us um, are really you know, reminiscent to me being a former NASA associate. I, I was uh, privileged to work with uh, Dr. Chris McKay, mm. you know, looking for a different branch of life, possibly, you know, not just expecting our, to see ourselves, <laughs> very human to do that. Um, and he always told me, you know, where there's water, there's life. And we got a really great question here from Sama who asked, uh, why are we searching for water beyond earth? Perhaps uh, microbes or you know, extraterrestrial life are, are made in another way. And what's your opinion in this regard? It's, it is a great, great question. And right in the sort of the, the center of astrobiology is, is a bit of like dramatic tension. You feel yourself being pulled in different directions. Because at one hand, you don't want to assume that life on other planets will be just the same as us. You might expect it to be quite different, it could be based on very different chemistry, um, it could be based on things other than water, or perhaps even other than organic chemistry, not carbon-based life. But on the other hand, you're a scientist. You, you've got to base your hypotheses and your expectations on what you've already understood, what you've already observed, what you can do an experiment on, on Earth, or by sending a robot to Mars. So you want to try to not be too blinkered and only look for life that's exactly like us. And you want to be broad-minded and think out the box, but you've also got to remain quite contained. You've only got so much money and so much time to look for life on other planets year on year. So it makes sense to look in the places that are most likely to have life, we think, and look for life we think is the most likely kind to exist. And one thing we do know with absolute certainty is that water-based organic life is possible. Hi. (laughs) We'll <laughs> be good examples of that. And we're also very good at finding that kind of life. I mean, if you go to a hospital with, with a septicemia, with blood infection, we've got very good at finding bacteria where they shouldn't be on Earth. So we can apply those same techniques to finding water-based, organic-based life on Mars or Europa. And I think it makes most sense to look for that kind of life first. But you're right. Maybe life could be not only water-based, but maybe based on ammonia as well, maybe based on methane which is why Titan is a very exciting possibility as well. Lost my Zoom panel there for a second, but I have a second question from YouTube that kind of follows along the lines that you were talking about. Um, and you know, just he's asking about the chemistry, which is also something that we mentioned and, and your work with ExoMars team. And you know we have these missions on Mars, um, this current the one that Perseverance is on Mars is planning a, a sample return mission. Mm. So obviously we'll be able to analyze, hopefully, uh, something that's brought back to us. But he's thinking of some rem- more remote science, which is why we, we create these missions and these robots to do, um, you know, to do kind of the science that a human would do. Um, obviously, you know, um, in a different way. But can uh, um, his name is Zap Van. <laughs> I'm going to say that. And he asks on YouTube, can we make a small instrument um, able to tell the difference between that right and left handed amino acids or chemistry? Yes. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the words I hinted at in the talk was, was biosignatures, signs of life, which we think we can be unambiguous, be sure about is due to life and not due to non-living processes. It's not a geological process that makes this, it's a biological, uniquely biological process that gives us this biosignature. And all life on earth is based on proteins and those proteins are built out of strings of amino acids stuck end to end. But amino acids are quite simple little organic molecules. And you can have two different versions of each amino acids, two different mirror image version. So it's like having a left-handed and right-handed version. And all life on Earth uses left-handed amino acids, but right-handed sugars. And we don't really know why that is. It could just be chance. It could be completely by luck that the left-handed or right-handed version was chosen, as it were, when life was developing on the primordial Earth. But if you find um, in a sample that you're trying to analyze on Earth or on, on Mars, some simple organic chemistry, that in itself doesn't tell you that there is life because we find simple organics and meteorites as well. Well, uh, Carbon is just really good at doing simple chemistry. 
So if you find lots of amino acids, that in itself doesn't tell us that there's life there. But if you only find left-hand amino acids, that now starts looking pretty suspicious. You're not getting an even mixture, you're finding only amino acids of one kind, only left-handed versions like on Earth. And actually what would be most exciting is if we were to find simple organic chemistry in our Mars sample, find amino acids, and actually find that they are all right-handed amino acids. Because that tells us two things now. That tells us we think we found signs of ancient life, and that life is different from terrestrial life because it uses the opposite-handed variants of the amino acids. Um, so when we're looking at these enantiomers, they're called these left or right-handed versions of, of amino acids or other simple organics, um, you're, the, the guy who asked the question is absolutely right. The person that asked the question is absolutely right. You can use simple instruments, simple equipment that not only detects amino acids, but can also tell you whether they are left or right-handed. And uh, NASA's rovers have got this capability. The ESA ExoMars rover can detect amino acids uh, as well. Lewis, I'd like to spend the next, uh, I guess, nine minutes before we get to um, one o'clock to talk about careers. And uh, I think you've got quite a, an exciting career. And um, I guess you could call it like a hyphenated professional identity <laughs> in that you're a, a researcher and an author. Um, what effect does that have on you as a person, like being a researcher and an author? How does it affect your life? How does it affect <laughs> the fulfillment? Well, of it certainly keeps me busy. It keeps it keeps me out of trouble, um, but for as long as I can remember, I've I've I've, I've been interested in science. Like I found it fascinating to, to understand how the world around you works, and I've been really lucky to get into a very exciting field of science in terms of astrobiology and looking for life on other planets. But throughout that whole process, I've I've also been really interested in more creative avenues, like telling people about these exciting discoveries. Um, writing about them, uh, writing books, writing magazine articles, being much more creative in that outlet. So I've been very lucky in my career to be able to balance those two things against each other. But what I, I would say is that they're not like they're opposites. You, whichever walk of life you get into, it's helpful to be to have got better at communicating, to, to have developed communication skills, whether that is writing a newspaper article or writing a report for your boss. Um, every time I do a talk at a school or something like this, I get that little bit better at phrasing things so they make sense. I get better at communicating um, and doing like public talks, which is better in, in, in other avenues of your career as well, you know, delivering a seminar, uh, whichever job you get into. So I think a lot of that is, is what's known as transferable skills. You, you can get good at or get better at communicating in general, and that helps you in lots of different areas. Um, and, and personally for me, I, I just, like I say, I just really like telling people about things and writing about them as well. I, I find that's a really nice other half to my career alongside being in the lab and, and, and doing experiments. A question from Jade, which is on the same track, and it's uh, about her science blog that she's been writing for two years. And she's thinking about if it's possible to go into freelance science writing, if, uh, even it being a teenager, uh, or do you have to wait until you've got a degree? Like, what what are the barriers to succeeding there? No, I think I think that's I think that's wonderful. Um, if, if Jade has got the link for her blog post, I'd encourage her to post it because um, I'd love to see, and I'm, I'm sure other people would love to, to have a look at what she's been writing as well. And you you, you can't start too early. It's not, it's not a problem that you're you're a teenager because starting to develop these skills and improve them um, is is gonna is is a really great thing to have started. It, it's you know it's like going to the gym and exercising often to get fitter or for your muscles to develop. Every time you do writing, you're developing that skill. It only gets better by doing it. Um, and I started writing when I was uh, an A-level student as well. I continued that writing when I was an undergraduate uh, student doing my degree. My first ever paid published piece of writing, I got a hundred pounds for writing 2000 words um, for a um, popular maths website being run out of um, University of Cambridge at the time called PLUS. And I wrote about how we can teach computers to play games. Um, and that was the very first thing I ever wrote. And I've never looked back. I've just taken little steps after little steps to get there. But starting writing your own blog is a really good way of doing it. You're not only 
improving each time you write something in your blog. But another really important thing to have when you do come to approach a website or a magazine or newspaper is to be able to show the editor stuff that you've written already. And in the olden days, you would post them some newspaper clippings, things you'd literally cut out with a pair of scissors from a printed pulped up bit of tree that had been printed on and you would post that to the editor so they could read what you've written. Nowadays, you just do it yourself. You can just put it immediately up on your own blog and it's there to send someone a link in an email. Um, if you wanna get into TV work, you can just set up your own YouTube channel. If you wanna get into radio work, you can create your own podcast completely for free and using just simple technology like the phone or laptop or computer you've probably already got access to at school. So these are really good opportunities to get started, even at school, even as a GCSE or A-level student. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's quite an um, empowering uh, response there. And it's definitely uh, a positive one and top tips there. I'll pass over to Lucinda. Thanks, Joe. I think it's great definitely to talk about like, how did you get to where you are now, especially for GCSE students and A-level students who have that coming up quickly in their future. And it, I found basically the path isn't linear for me. And I wonder, you know, um, you know, some students, some, some, some question that's coming up from Karen is, you know, what courses, should we take courses in, in science communication? I completely agree with you that really taking the action to just try it out. There's so many opportunities mm. now, but what, do, I mean, how about for you with science communication? This was brilliant. Thank you so much. I mean, I was enthralled and just like completely focused on everything you were saying and showing. I actually wish I could put more attention on to it other than running this you know this event I wish I was an attendee in that sense um, and so I'm looking forward to having you back <laughs> actually but what would you say to a student who maybe you know I don't know in, in the educational pathway or did you do anything outside of you know your normal science studies to kind of broaden your science communication abilities yeah I think I think that's a really important point that again in the olden days like 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 my father um, was an engineer, he, he fixed airplanes for his entire life, and, and that was his job, that was his career, he worked for the same employer his entire career. Um, and if you, want to do, if you wanted to be an accountant, you would train and do your accountancy exams, and you would perhaps move between different accountancy firms, but you would largely do the same thing for your career. I just don't think that happens anymore, that the, the career paths are much less clear, They're much more kind of branchy, and you can move around a lot more which I think is wonderful, having that freedom and flexibility to take your skills that you've developed and move them between different jobs and, and do whatever you find interesting at the time. But on the other hand, it also makes things a bit harder. It's hard to know what do I have to do to get that career? What should I do now that'll help me in, in five years' time? And I can only really speak from my own experience, which is at every sort of stepping stone in my life, my career, I've done the next thing which I was passionate about, which I thought was exciting, and that I could see perhaps what the next step after that would be. But I've never had any idea where I was going to be in 10 years or 15 years time. You know, you know, you really see one or two steps in front of you. Um, and that's why I mentioned earlier that I knew I wanted to get into writing, being, being a journalist. So like Jade, I just started doing it. You know, you find time on the odd, odd evening, find time on the odd Saturday afternoon, um, and start your own blog, start your own podcast, start your own YouTube channel, or if it's not communication you're interested in, whatever it is, you can turn your hobby into your career and, and make, you know, make a salary, pay your mortgage, pay your rent and go to restaurants um, by monetizing your, your passion. It, it's, 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 those opportunities are very much open. Yeah, that, that's um, great advice. I absolutely agree. Um, and I think that's why we did this section, I mean, not only is it because it's current with all the missions to Mars and other planets um, exploring our solar system, but also because it's collaboration between the Royal Astronomical Society, Astronomy and Geophysics and, and Space Science, and also the Linnaean Society and Evolution of Life. Um, you know, so going beyond Earth and, and um, you know, learning what we can um, about 
the environment around us, space and our, our local and our, our neighborhood, but also we learn more about ourselves here on earth. Um, and it gets us thinking, you know, I, I'm so excited about this field of astrobiology. Um, I've been, you know, and like you have been part of it for uh, quite a, a couple of decades now. Um, I think when I first went to school, I, I was looking forward to astrogeology, astrogeo my background's in geology. So um, now it's all called uh, planetary science. Mm is absolutely amazing. So I'm just really excited for everything. We would love to have you back anytime. Um, and uh, Joe, if you want to also uh, join me in saying thank you so much for being with us and sharing you know, your experience with our audience. And hopefully our audience is a lot of students who um, have a really exciting future to look forward to. And I'm so thankful to you, um, Lewis, for also talking about exoplanets and um, things beyond our solar system. And I'm definitely gonna take your suggestion that that should probably be one of our um, astrobiology talks for 2021. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you everyone, cheers. Thank you, so much, <laughs> and, um, thank you all for joining us. We are gonna have, again, this continues um, every week, every Thursday from 12 to one. Um, thank you from the RAS. Thank you for the Linnaeus Society, bye-bye.